if you're in North Korea and you think that the Americans in the rock are coming, your smartest move is to go early and go massively because you don't know what's going to survive. Uh, and you know there is we've, we've talked about benefits of the of survivability, uh, and I think Pakistan and India are getting to numbers where the idea of splendid first strike is hard to really envision, despite what the Indian thinking may be evolving toward. But against North Korea, it, it's plausible, uh, and so you're getting into territory of first strike instability, uh, and then you add the pathologies of leadership on top of it. And I don't think you know we haven't lived in our generation through. Uh, anything potentially that terrifying. A top U.S. general says North Korea has not changed its military posture despite the recent escalation of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. But he also says the regime remains a clear and present threat to the United States with a uh, capability to strike the mainland with ballistic missiles. Something that uh, General Hyten said is something I've also said in public is that whether it's three months or six months or 18 months, mm -hmm. it is soon. And, uh, and we ought to conduct ourselves as though it is just a matter of time and a matter of very short time before North Korea has that capability. One of the issues that we all ought to appreciate is that as the capacity of the threat increases, that is the size, not just the lethality, not just the fact that North Korea can reach us, but the numbers of missiles that they may possess that can reach us. And what we need to be concerned about is ensuring that our ballistic missile defense capability keeps pace with that threat. It's a normal day for people at U.S. Army Garrison Humphreys. Well, not exactly. A civil defense drill is taking place in which the military police on post make sure everyone seeks shelter in place. And traffic is at a halt. But this isn't the first time a drill like this has happened. We do this exercise monthly basis. The main reason why we wanted to do this exercise is to exercise the emergency service and security personnel. Uh, to improve uh, response time and efficiency in securing the installation. With the monthly civil defense drills occurring each month, soldiers, civilians, and their families on post are able to be more vigilant of real-world situations that could happen within their installations. Senior Airman Angeline Pangolinen, USAG Humphreys, Republic of Korea. Although Russia's foreign ministry has just revealed that it is engaged in behind-the-scenes diplomatic activity to try and calm tensions on the Korean Peninsula, at the moment they're not saying what that activity uh, constitutes. The Russian position at the moment is that it believes that sanctions uh, are essentially running out of steam. It has voted uh, for sanctions twice recently in the UN Security Council, but I don't think it's going to go any further. Uh, and also Russia believes that any conflicts on the Korean Peninsula would be absolutely catastrophic. I think it's clear that Moscow's position is that Donald Trump is being irresponsible uh, in the language that he's using at the moment and ratcheting up tensions. So what might Russia be able to do to calm the situation down? Well, actually, Russia does have fairly good uh, economic uh, and to some degree political relations with Pyongyang, and it could use these uh, if it wanted to. So perhaps it believes that the carrots is the best way forward rather than the stick that Mr. Trump uh, seems to favour. Um, if you read people like Dmitry Trenin, who's the head of the uh, Carnegie Centre here in Moscow, he thinks that perhaps Moscow could persuade North Korea not necessarily to give up its nuclear weapons because that's unlikely to happen. Vladimir Putin has said that the North Koreans would eat grass before uh, Pyongyang gave up its nukes. But more that Moscow to, could persuade Pyongyang to um, put into place some kind of strategic re restraint. And it could do that um, by offering it uh, economic sweeteners. Uh, it could maybe do gas deals with North Korea. It could maybe um, restore rail links and also boost the number of North Korean workers uh, who are currently working uh, in Russia. Things that can actually help the North Korean economy and persuade Pyongyang that the march to war is not in anyone's best interests. 
I cannot conceive of a situation where North Korea would start a massive conventional war or uh, use its nuclear weapons because Korea needs its nuclear weapons to consolidate the regime and to tell North Korean people that they are advanced and so on, they are nuclear power and so on. But I uh, can easily conceive of North Korea continuing, continuing testing nuclear weapons and developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. And if here in the United States this is considered intolerable and the United States used conventional forces to destroy, to disarm North Korea, then it might use nuclear weapons if any are left after such an attack. Well, I would just note um, that a few years ago I was doing research in the Saddam Hussein archives here um, at the National Defense University and saw so many examples of Saddam's yes-men telling him that his military capabilities was much greater than it was because he had asked them to get that capability and when they couldn't get it, of course, they couldn't tell him that. I worry, for example, when you see the pictures of Kim Jong-un with uh, his generals and, and missiles on the drawing boards launching towards the United States, that may just be pure propaganda, but it could also be propaganda for their, their lone leader. And in these scenarios, I think we need to worry very deeply about how much understanding he has of his own military limitations. But as little as he has of the understanding, he cannot imagine that North Korea would survive after American retaliation. So this is a scary scenario because yeah. uh, I, I've been talking to a lot of people say they're actually surprised that North Korea hasn't lobbed a missile at Guam or Hawaii or Japan or Seoul. But this is something they could do that might be a more grave, have a, a more grave outcome than a nuclear bomb blowing up in the continental U.S. Yeah, this kind of an H-bomb, an, an EMP or an HEMP, as mm -hmm. the computer people call it, 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 is the worst case scenario. That is it, a nuclear holocaust. And it, it would be a situation where a hydrogen bomb is dropped over the contiguous United States and it completely completely disrupts the electric grid in this country, meaning no access to any electricity, to running water, to any, you know, to the internet. I just want to ally everyone's fears. This is unlikely to happen. To Why is least. it unlikely? But if, if it's North Korea, yeah. if they're developing nuclear weapons and, and they back up some of the talk they've been using lately, yeah. why would we put that past them? Because this is an incredibly sophisticated style of an attack. Not only does it require the correct nuclear technology and the correct instrument to deliver it to the United States, but it requires an incredible amount of military hardware sophistication that we're not entirely sure they have. Yes. But it is worrisome to the degree that the power companies in this country, the utility companies, have been thinking about this. The government has been thinking about it and since so the what, 60s. What, what sort of safety measures new. are in place? for something like this, because obviously you can't test it. Since the 60s, it has been illegal to do any high altitude right. yeah. nuclear testing like that for obvious reasons, but what sort of backup? There, this is where there's not a lot of great news. The United States is woefully, the, the United States government is woefully unprepared for an attack like this. This has been covered already, but uh, I think one of the challenges we are facing today is, and uh, Alexei mentioned it in, in his intervention, is that the rules of the game are not clear. And when I speak rules of the game, I also mean the system of escalation. I mean, during the Cold War, the uh, aspect which avoided massive strikes and counter-strikes or any use of nuclear weapons was the clear ladder of escalation, which was possible from taking us with the smallest sort of use of low-level tactical nuclear weapon to the highest and most damaging exchange. Nowadays, this connection, this ladder has been, well, you might say it has been broken. So it is not clear anymore what will lead to what. And uh, I believe that could be one of the potential risks when we speak about the leaders coming to the idea of a limited strategy.
strike or escalate to de-escalate or some of these more uh, limited options. Uh, I, I think that is uh, something which, uh, which is there. The new rules are not clear, but it is also because the nature of the countries we are talking about has changed, uh, the nature of technology has changed. Uh, that is clearly uh, something which uh, we have to consider.